Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to kind of be uh, be here, I guess, kind of like in, in front of you in, uh, in, in your homes um, while you're all going through this lockdown. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of the brethren here in, uh, in East Tennessee are praying for you all. Um, everyone there in Australia, we've been um, keeping up to date with our, with our brethren and uh, we're, we're all um, earnestly uh, praying for you. We're laboring earnestly, you know, for all those going through uh, the, this lockdown in Australia. And that is a topic that I wanted to talk about um, this, uh, this evening, morning, evening for me, morning for you, um, is that, that concept of laboring earnestly in prayer. I mean, if you have your Bibles with you, if you could please turn to Colossians chapter 4, and I want to read verse 12 to 13, we read about this character um, called Epaphras. So Colossians chapter 4, verse 12 and 13 reads, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify for him that he has deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Heropolis. How would you describe the prayer life of, some, of someone you look up to? It, maybe it's a spiritual mentor or, or, or someone you know, someone who you, you know has a really good prayer life, someone you look up to. We might use words to describe their prayer life like frequent, heartfelt, spiritual, silent. These are kind of words we often think about when it comes to prayer. But I think rarely we would use use words like laboring earnestly or, 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 or other such, um, so other such uh, terms. But this is the way Paul describes the prayers of Epaphras in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. The word translated there as laboring earnestly in the New American Standard is the word agonizomai, that is Greek word, which, which means to struggle or contend with, to strive or to fight or compete. Um, often a used word, sorry, this word is often used with regards to wrestling in, in the Olympic Stadium and things like that. Um, so that's this word, agonizomai. And the NIV, if anyone uses the NIV, they will see that it's helpfully translated there as wrestling in prayer. And I think that's a really good concept, a really good uh, picture in our minds as to how Epaphras' prayer life uh, must have been, is this wrestling in prayer. My question this morning, and what I want to dive into, is what does that look like? What does it mean to wrestle in prayer? What does it mean to agonize in prayer, which is a word we get from the Greek word agonizomai? What does it mean to labor earnestly in prayer? Firstly, let's look at a few things with regards to prayer, a few um, facts about prayer, I guess. Um, firstly, the importance of prayer. In verse 13, we, we get the, the concept there that, that, that Epaphras was laboring in prayer. So prayer is something that is a work. Prayer is hard work. It's often so something we can find ourselves struggling to do. I know some people do find it e easy to, um, to get into their prayer life. Maybe they've grown up saying prayers, so it's very easy to get, in get into. But a lot of new converts have, have a lot of trouble with prayer, a lot of uh, struggle with, with getting into prayer. And even maybe for some of us who... Um, you know, haven't done it in a while, or, or maybe we have, we've only dealt, dealt with prayers like before a meal or in church or anything like that. And we struggle to, to, to have private prayer. We struggle to labor earnestly or wrestle in prayer. How often do we find ourselves setting aside, setting aside time for private prayer? But as we begin, we wander off. Suddenly the the day's to-do list pops up in our mind or something pops up in our mind and, and we're distracted by, by, by a new set of thoughts. Quickly serious? we catch ourselves and we return back to our prayer. We come back to the prayer. We refocus before something else distracts us. And then this cycle continues over and over and over again until eventually we decide, you know what? I'm no good at this. I give up. I may as well get something done. If that sounds like something you've experienced, then you're definitely not alone in that. Prayer is something that is hard work. Prayer is hard work. We should not be trying to fool ourselves into thinking that prayer is easy. Prayer, rather, is a labor, as we see with, uh, with Epaphras. But as hard as it is, prayer is a powerful and rewarding work. 
It is something that in and of itself is powerful. We often think to ourselves that prayer might be something that we do to bring about something great. You know, we pray to God and then God is going to do something great. But prayer is in and of itself a great and powerful work. It is something great by itself. We need to consider this what, for, for what a great blessing it is that we as Christians have the ability to lay our burdens before an almighty God. We have the ability to speak and make our appeals to an almighty God. That is an incredible blessing. It is an incredible um, benefit that we have as, as Christians. It is, a, uh, it is a powerful and rewarding work. Often it is, uh, it is treated as a last resort by many people. I know this is something that, uh, that I struggle with personally. If someone comes to me with an, an appeal for help, if someone comes to me with, a, with something they're struggling with, and I'm not in a position to help them personally, I say, well, you know, sorry, I can't do much about your situation. Sorry, I can't physically help you, but I can pray about it. As, as though it were this, this last resort, as though it were this something that's, you know, I can't do anything real, but I can pray. We ought to look at, at prayer as something as much more powerful than that. We ought to look at our prayer as more powerful than anything that we can do in someone's situation. Do we really believe that anything that we can do is more powerful than, appeal, than an appeal made to a holy God? That is the most... and. The, the most helpful and the most powerful thing we can do for someone. If any of our brethren are struggling, prayer ought to be our first response. Prayer ought to be our priority. Genuine and sincere prayer is the greatest and most powerful contribution that we can make to any effort. I know recently when, when I started um, making plans to come here to school, I was asking, uh, asking people for support. I was asking people for financial support. And what I really struggled with was, you know, a lot of people would say, sorry, we can't, um, we, we can't financially, we're not in a position to financially support you, but we will continue to pray for you. We are going to pray for you. And, you know, to me, getting those emails was kind of like a disappointment, you know, oh, okay, I got rejected fin for financial support and I'm only getting prayers. I ought to think of prayer as something much more powerful than that. I ought to recognize that they are doing the best good for my work that they possibly can. If they can do financial support, that's great as well. But the priority for my life and the things that I, I ought to strive for is the prayers of my brethren. That is the greatest and most powerful contribution they can make to, to anything that I can do. So prayer is a priority. If we turn to Acts chapter 6, we can see that the apostles made prayer a priority in their lives as well and in their work. Acts chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. It reads there, Now at this time, while the, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to ser serve tables. There were two other things, uh, sorry, uh, down to verse, verse four there. Oh, sorry, uh, three and four. Therefore, brethren, select from among you, among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, who, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer, and to the ministry of the word. There are two things in those passages that the, that the apostles did not neglect or would not neglect in order to do this work. This work needed to be done. This, this serving of food needed to be done. But the, there were two priorities that the apostles had that, that in their lives and in their work came above this priority. What they were not neglecting was one, the, the ministry of the word, and the other was prayer. So prayer and study, those were the two things that were priorities in the apostles' lives and their work. And I think perhaps we sometimes maybe give more priority to study than we do to prayer. And it is a good thing to prioritize study, particularly the study of the Bible uh, in our lives. That is certainly a priority that we ought to have. But we also ought to prioritize prayer. 
if you were to invite me to something, uh, say you you invited me around to dinner or uh, invited me to a to, to one of these uh, these Zoom meetings or something like that, and I and, and I responded, sorry, I I, I can't really come. I can't, I'd love to be there, um, but I can't be involved. I really need to spend time studying. You'd say, okay, fair enough. He's a Bible student. He needs to spend time studying. Maybe he needs to study for a sermon or, or whatever the case may be. We may um, understand that. Fair enough. You've got to prepare for Sunday. But what if I said, instead of that, I said, no, sorry, I can't, I can't come to this meeting. I can't come to dinner at your house. I really need to pray over something. I think perhaps in those situations, we might be a little less understanding. Perhaps, you know, perhaps that's a cultural thing, but we may think that that's less of a priority than study. We may think to ourselves, well, you know, you, you don't really have the commitment to prayer. You don't really have that, um, that necessary time allotted for, uh, for prayer or, or, or something like that. We don't see study as the same kind of priority as prayer. But the apostles certainly did in Acts chapter 6. Those were the two things they were not neglecting. If someone said, we want you to come and serve tables for these, these widows and orphans, we want you to serve food to these, these people. And we said, well, I really got to pray about something. That sounds like an excuse, doesn't it? It sounds like we're just trying to get out of doing actual real work to, to, to do something lazy. But that is actually what the apostles did. They devoted themselves to prayer because it was more of a priority. For the apostles, prayer was a priority that they should not be drawn away from. So prayer, as it's described in Colossians 4, it is a priority. It is also described, as, it, as we've read there, it's pictured as laboring earnestly. It's often a euphemism in uh, Christian um, Christianity to have quiet time with God. What we do is we kind of take this concept of prayer, we take the picture of what prayer is, and then we kind of mix it in with a lot of um, themes from the religious world or themes from um, worldly philosophy, such as meditation or quiet self-reflection. And then we mash this in together and we think that's what prayer is all about. Certainly, it's no bad thing to have this kind of um, this, this quiet reflection in, in prayer. It can be a good and healthy thing to do. But when was the last time that we genuinely wrestled in prayer? When was the last time we labored earnestly in prayer? When was the last time we prayed like the prophets did? If we turn to the, um, the book of Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk, just the uh, chapter one, verse, verse one to four, where Habakkuk opens his prayer, the oracle which, the ha which Habakkuk the prophet saw, how long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Do we pray like that? Does our prayer life sound anything like the prayers of the prophets? This is what I think it looks like to wrestle in prayer. This is what it looks like to labor earnestly in prayer. It's something real. It's a passionate plea made to God. The modern picture of a pious and spiritual person is often one who is uh, quiet, is calm, is, is spiritual. His prayer life is these, these quiet little prayers made, made to God. But I don't think that's necessarily the picture that God depicts in the Bible, particularly from his prophets. If you were to enter my home and you were to see my children, um, you know, Jules mentioned earlier, I've got a two-year-old and a one-year-old. Um, so if you were to come into my home and you, you saw them there sitting quietly, reading their Bibles, bowing their heads silently in prayer, you would likely look at that and say, wow, what spiritual and, 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 and wonderful little children you have. What spiritual children. Now, suppose, on the other hand, in a much more likely situation, you came into my home and you, you saw my children screaming at the top of their lungs and, 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 uh, and, and running around with, with, with mayhem and, and yelling about their, the, the injustice that they feel, yelling about the, their, their uh, various injustices. What would we think of that? I certainly don't think we'd say what spiritual children, but I think that is the picture of what God 
uh, if we examine the scriptures, if we examine the prayer of scripture, the latter is much closer to what a spirit-filled life looks like. Screaming to the sky in injustice is a much more spiritual life than the quiet reflection that we see so often, see so often depicted uh, in the spiritual lives of people today. Wrestling in prayer is active, it's passionate, and it's aggressive. These are things we no, don't often think about when it comes to our prayer. This is taking someone, taking someone who you want, uh, you want to pray for and putting them in a headlock in your prayers. We're, we're grabbing people and we're, we're wrestling with them. We're wrestling with, um, with people in our prayers, saying we want these people to be blessed. God, please bless these people. I think of um, uh, in, in, in the book of Genesis, uh, when, when Jacob wrestles with God, what he says there is he wrestles with him and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. That's this kind of the picture there of there's passion, there's aggression in his prayer. This is praying earnestly for your family and your loved ones. This is play, praying earnestly for your friends. This is not a half-hearted list that we emotionlessly flick through. Prayer is passionately and sincerely bringing our appeals to God. That's what wrestling in prayer is all about. That's what laboring earnestly in prayer looks like. So how do we do that? What, why, how, and what is this laboring earnestly in prayer? Why does God want us to wrestle in prayer? Would it not be easier for us just to list our desires and for him to give them to us? Like, you know, the reality is God doesn't need us to tell him what we need in our lives. He's very aware of what we need. He's, he's omniscient. He knows everything going on in our lives. He knows what we want and he knows what we need. So why does he want us to have this wrestle in prayer? Why does he want us to labor earnestly in prayer with him? I think if, we, if everything were easy for us, if we just got everything we listed to God and we just said, hey, God, I need um, A, B, and C, and then bam, 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 A, B, and C appear in front of us, that's, that it's, it sounds great. But I think when that happens, we don't learn to depend on God. We're not attuned with our need for God if that takes place. What happens in wrestling in prayer is we recognize a few things. Firstly, that when when those prayers are answered, when we wrestle and we agonize and we, we labor in prayer, when those prayers are answered, we are much more inclined to recognize that he is the author of that blessing. Rather than if we just list things off and then um, they take place, we say, hey, what a coincidence, what a wonderful thing that's, that's happened. What we need to do is recognize that God is the author of those things. And when we wrestle in prayer, when we wrestle, our humility is built up, our patience is built up, and our faith is built up to the point where we recognize God more in the, in, the, in the things that happen, in the answer of those prayers. We are more attuned to our need for God. God is most glorified when he is clearly seen to be the giver of what we ask for in prayer. That is what God wants in, in our prayer. He wants us to not only make our appeals known to him, but recognize that he is the author of the blessing of those prayers. He is the author of the answer of the prayers that we receive back. And that glorifies him. How do we pray then? We've noted that it's sometimes a hard thing to do. So how do we start? Firstly, we pray with discipline. We need to set aside time for prayer. It is often a, a caricature, I think, that we uh, prayer is supposed to be spontaneous, that we kind of over-spiritualize it with that, with that picture of other, other world religions, that it needs to be uh, just happen spontaneously. Suddenly we're, we're in a prayer, suddenly we're talking to God. But it is something that we need to use discipline with. It is something that we need to actually think about and set aside time for. If we are to truly wrestle in prayer, we need to designate time where we will be undistracted and unhurried in doing so. If we are actually going to spend time wrestling and agonizing in prayer, we can't just do this on our morning commute to work. We can't just do this in, our, uh, in a spare five minutes that we might have available. We need to set aside time to actually agonize over the things that trouble us. It's going to be at different times for everyone. For some, it might be the best to do this first thing in the morning. For others, when the kids go down for a nap, but whatever it is, we need to set aside that time where we can take time to pray, unhurried and undistracted. Secondly, need, secondly we need to pray with direction. 
We need to think about what we're praying for. We need to know what we're praying for. We don't just launch into it with, uh, with, with no direction, with, without any idea of what we're going to pray for. Often prayer is, is, is seen as it needs to be this spontaneous thing where you just, um, you just blurt out whatever's on your heart at the time. And, you know, that, that certainly in some cases uh, a, a, a healthy thing to do. But if we're to wrestle in prayer, if we're to labor earnestly in prayer, then we need to think about what we're going to pray for. There is no use in wrestling in prayer if we have no direction or purpose behind it, or if we're merely praying for the things we think we're supposed to be praying for. For some, it may be enough to just start praying and launch into earnest laboring. For others, we may need to actually set, uh, write down a list, put, it, put down a, uh, a bit of paper and write the things that we need to pray for. Take time before you pray to consider the things you want to pray for. When you set aside that time to pray, take time first to think about what you're actually going to pray for and then take the time to wrestle and agonize with it when you, when you make that appeal to God. And thirdly, we need to pray with love. Prayer is not just an act we do because we're Christians. It's not just something we, we do because the Bible tells us to, although that's a very sufficient reason to do it, but that's not the only reason we do it. We, do, we pray as an expression of love. How much do we love someone if we never pray for them? You know, we're told we need to be loving our brethren. We need to um, have a genuine heartfelt love for, for, for other Christians. But how, how can we say we honestly love them if we never mention them in our prayers? It is something that we, we ought to be doing. We ought to be praying for those we love. Therefore, we ought to be praying for the brethren. If we care about the struggles and hardships of our brethren, then we will pray for them out of necessity. If we love them, we will pray for them. And it is also an expression of love to the one we pray to. If we love God, then we will love to talk to him. If we love God, we will want to talk to him. This is the case with any relationship. If we say we love our wife, but then never take any time to spend time with her, or we have no desire to spend time with her, then we can't really say that we love her, can we? We can't, we can't say we love our wives if we don't want to spend that time with her, if we don't want to talk to her. This is the case with the relationship with God as well. If we love God, then we will want to spend time talking to him. We will want to spend time in his word and we will want to spend time making our appeals known to him. This is what relationship is all about. So what then do we pray for? That's why, why we wrestle in prayer. That's how we wrestle in prayer. What do we pray for? I think this is, this is perhaps the greatest struggle. If we, if, if we start our prayer and we just draw a blank, we don't know what we're, we're actually going to say. There's a few things we can actually do. And I think it's here in Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 4 where we read, um, a few things that we can pray for. It's a very good idea that if you don't know what to pray for, pray from the Bible because there's plenty of things to pray for in the Bible. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So that's number one, thanksgiving. We can pray for, uh, for the things that we have. We can, we, we can thank God for what we have. Thank God for what he's done in our life. And if there's nothing going on in our life at the time, thank God for that. Thank, for him, thank him for the peace that we have in our lives. Whatever it might be, we, have, we, all, we all have something that we can be thankful for. So open your prayers perhaps with a, a prayer of thanksgiving from, from Colossians chapter 4 verse 2. Colossians chapter 4 verse 3. Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to, to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned. So secondly, we have, th so firstly, we have thanksgiving. Secondly, we have open doors. Pray for the evangelistic efforts of the church. If there are efforts that you are supporting, pray for those. Pray earnestly for those efforts. Pray for the preaching of your congregation. Pray for your friends and your family, that God may open doors for them to be evangelistic. Pray for your own situation, that you can be evangelistic and take, take hold of those opportunities as they present themselves. So that's secondly, pray for open doors for us to speak about Christ. And thirdly, in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12, 
is to pray for maturity. Epaphras, who is one among your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers, that you may stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. Your, your version of the Bible there may, may read mature. That is another thing that we ought to be, ought to be praying for, praying for maturity. <clears throat> Pray for the maturity of the church your own congregation, pray for the maturity of other congregations, pray, pray for the maturity of your brethren, of your children, of your own maturity. It is one of the most important things that we can pray for in our, in our lives is that, that we grow in Christ, that others around us grow in Christ. So if we're struggling to find what we, what we need to pray for, those are three uh, starting points. If we can remember them by... Um, uh, by an acrostic, we go thanksgiving, open doors and maturity, we can pray for Tom. That's how we can remember this. We can pray for Tom if we don't know what to pray for. So my exhortation to you this morning, evening here, morning there, it is to spend time wrestling in prayer rather than just, uh, rather than just spending time in prayer, rather than just saying, um, let's, let's have a time of prayer and then going through a through a prayer list emotionlessly and just going through the motions, I want, I want each of us to, to actually make a conscious effort to wrestle in prayer, to agonize in prayer, to think about something that's going on in the world or with our brethren or in our own lives and agonize over that, wrestle over those things. This is something I, I, I say uh, to, uh, to, to exhort each and every one of us, that it's something that's just generally you know, in, in a sermon, you, you end with an exhortation, I want you to do this, but I also wanted to make an appeal to you um, personally as well, that you make, uh, you, you make efforts to wrestle in prayer over me and my family as we're, um, you know, we're away from home, we're, we're out in this uh, situation, I've I got to be honest with you, it's very crazy for us, we, <laughs> we're, we're, we're halfway across the world and we're away from home and, and going through school is is certainly an effort. So I, I make this appeal to you personally that I want you to, to pray for, for, uh, for me as well. Um, let's not allow our prayer life to become something that's just reeling off a list of things to God. Let's believe in the power of prayer. Let's recognize what, what a wonderful work it is. Let's pray sincerely and passionately to God. Let's pray deliberately and with purpose. Let's pray with a concept in mind. Let's pray with a direction in mind. And let's labor earnestly in our prayers, each and every one of us. Thank you for your time.